Good morning, how are you? It's another lovely day, really, really sunny. Didn't manage to get out and do my uh, sunbathing this morning, but uh, I had to sit out last night. I did a, a old man thing and sat out on the deck chair with the um, blanket on my knees, you know? First time I've done that. Saw it actually in the Netherlands. No, I didn't, I saw it in uh, Copenhagen which is, uh, you know, I mean, obviously reasonably cold all the year round. So what they do with their outdoor cafes is they have like a blanket on the back of every chair. And if it's a little bit chilly, then they have these uh, heaters, you know. So basically they've sort of tried to turn themselves into an outdoor society by uh, responding to customers' demands not to freeze to death, I suppose, and uh, putting heaters and blankets out. And I thought, oh, that's right, but blanket on your knees, cool. It's not the sort of thing that you just see in residential care. So anyway, and who invented the deck chair anyway? That's what I want to know. I mean, <clears throat> I do like a deck chair because you're so, you're chilled out, aren't you? You're laid back, you're very comfortable. It sort of fits into your body shape, etc., etc. And um, but then then there's a rod that goes right behind your head. I mean, am I buying the wrong size deck chair? Are there different sizes? Do I need a larger one? Because I'm. I've got a funny sort of body shape. My hips are too far down, which means I have uh, short legs. And uh, when I appear to be taller than every, than I am when I'm sitting down, if you see what I mean. So when when uh, if there's like a group of people in a room and they're all standing up, I'll be like the same height as everyone else. But then when we all go to the table and sit down, I'm like an inch taller than everyone else, just because my I've got a short legs and a long trunk, which is why I always say. That, uh, Never got me any dates, but it is true. Yeah, so this deck chair, so it's not enough to have just a blanket. I've got to have like some sort of pillow behind my head to stop my skull scraping on this rod. And then, you know, you want to put your feet up, so you've got to get something for your feet and then make sure that you're near a table so that you can put your coffee on a table next to you, etc., etc. It's a this is a, relaxing is a bloody hard work, that's all I can say. But I got there in the end, and I suppose as I do more and more of it, I'll get better and better. I don't do much sitting around. So look, uh, if you're watching this video, it, it'll be it, because you renewed your subscription. So those of you who don't have 1st of June as a renewal date can ignore all this because, um, <coughs> excuse me, it only applies to everybody who renewed on the 1st of June or, or was due to renew on the 1st of June and uh, the uh, and that's only because we used to do monthly direct debits and then we decided to cut down the work from by a factor of 12 to 1 so we did annual direct debits and the date that we chose to do the annual direct debits because they, that was the biggest number of monthly direct debits was the 1st of June and so uh, for a couple of years in the old GDPA and DPA we had annual direct debits on the 1st of June and uh, this year the direct debits are off the table which is a shame because a lot of people I know there'll be a lot of inertia there a lot of people will have been paying by direct debit and forgotten or won't sort of throwing stones at me Will have, will have forgotten or will have, uh, you know, won't mind it just keep trickling out. But as soon as they've got to do anything, they'll think, well, okay, I'll just won't bother with that, you know. So I'm sure we'll lose some members over it. But it's not, you know, direct debits is not the way forward, really, for the association. It's uh, the, the banks are very, very much more funny now about who they give direct the ability to direct debit to because really the what they've done is they've expanded what you can do as a direct debit originator so you know if I had like a thousand direct debits I could literally put each direct debit through for two thousand pounds and run off with two million and uh, the banks would be would have to underwrite that they'd have to refund all their money and, and get it back off for me and uh, they don't like that it's for someone who's not a big company, uh, it's an unacceptable risk. And it's true to say that if they are, we asked them now for direct debit facility, they wouldn't grant it to us. 
it's only because we historically had one, you know, for 30, 40 years that uh, they've not, they've not withdrawn it. So, um, yeah, so direct debits uh, have been replaced more or less by online payments, haven't they? But uh, the generation of uh, dentists that sort of were the backbone of the GDPA are not the, the generation that are uh, used to doing direct on, online payments. So um, there's going to be some there's going to be some fall off. I'm sure of members, which is a shame uh, because I'm sure that the people who fall off won't necessarily mean to deprive us of income or uh, wish the association ill or uh, you know be unhappy at all it's just uh, naturally a natural phenomenon it's just the uh, natural uh, what's the word uh, inertia you know will just cause cause a drop off of income but fortunately the association is infinitely scalable so you can get a situation where you have um, you know you say you say to people look you know we've got X number of members and but if we don't get roughly the same next year then the association isn't viable and then what happens is people think well well I don't want to get caught out by being one of the few that renews uh, and find that I am a member and have already paid my money for an association that isn't viable because no other buggers paid and so what happens is that then means that everybody is less likely to pay once they hear that and so the whole thing becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy so I'd just like to reassure you that uh, if you join, you'll get the membership benefits. It doesn't matter if there's only me and you in it. Uh, there will be, uh, it is infinitely scalable. So, and that's because a lot of what's, uh, you know, I mean, basically your membership subscriptions fund the assistance that you need and the rest of it I sort of stick in free of charge because it doesn't cost me anything to do these videos. Uh, which is just as well. <laughs> I mean, it's just as well for you. It doesn't because, uh, you know, otherwise I'd have people ringing in and saying, I hope these videos aren't costing me anything. <laughs> anyway, what's um, the association, you know, obviously in the last few years has made quite a few, uh, I wouldn't call them breakthroughs, but we've taken a few stances on things that have. Uh, more than recoup the cost of membership and the PRS PPL is the one that comes to mind last year um, and there are a few others which off the top of my head I can't recall but I, you know if I remember them tomorrow or Monday I'll, I'll bring them up we have to decide going forwards though what we want to do about the association and what you know how how it could best how we could best use it because it is a mutual and um, you know we need to think about things like possibly like indemnity um, and uh, not uh, you know because we get a lot of calls about indemnity we get let me sort of tell you about the way the associations working at the moment first of all if you're one of the people that uh, has emailed me in response to one of these uh, videos or um, like yesterday sent me you know some more material which is relevant to the topic of the video which yesterday was a referral into secondary care for MOS, then, uh, you know, that's greatly appreciated and very helpful and sort of actually quite true to the spirit of which, in which a mutual uh, association operates. If you are, uh, you know, if you feel that you need assistance, and obviously from time to time people do, and you email in, then again, that is also greatly appreciated because that's, the purpose of the uh, of the organisation is to assist, uh, support, and represent members in general practice, and uh, you know the support and the representation, and particularly the support element of it, is the day to day, the sort of the bread and butter side of things. So, for example, um, we had an inquiry yesterday about how to from a member who is sort of having trouble obtaining indemnity and um, wanted to know. You know, and had been put on quite a high rate because he had been assessed at a reasonably high risk uh, due to his claims history and wanted to know what was the best way to reduce the, the indemnity uh, cost every year because he felt that he, you know, 
he couldn't really support being on this very, very high rate for the rest of his life. Wanted to know how long it was gonna, he was gonna be on this high rate, whether he was ever gonna be on a low rate again, and what was the best way to go from high to low. And uh, so we were able to give him some sort of quite concrete advice about exactly how to reduce his rate. Not only because, you know, obviously we have contacts within the industry, but also we know, we, you know, we have the experience about how the industry works and what, what might be successful in that sort of context. And that applies across the whole spectrum of activity in, you know, on every single question. Uh, usually we, we can make a sort of a positive contribution. So, but the people don't always want to be, um, you know, I mean, where, where we can, and we used to have the old letters page in the magazine, uh, you know, we used to anonymize the letters and um, it was quite informative and useful and, you know, and perhaps you could have a chuckle about someone who's fallen into a bear trap that you managed to avoid. Um, but, um, you know, people don't always want to have their grievances <laughs> all over an email so uh, so please don't think that that's necessarily going to happen if you want to contact us then uh, I mean obviously we always anonymize everything and we go to great pains to anonymize everything because we know how small this profession is and um, I know that uh, you know if I write in an email that oh so and so you know was uh, was getting divorced from his uh, uh, his wife and uh, had uh, you know sold his surgery and uh, you know has got uh, into problems with his commissioning authorities and this is the problem. Then some bugger somewhere is going to say, "I know who that is." <laughs> you know, that's old Fred out the road there. You know, oh no, I didn't know that about him. You know, and so I can, obviously I can understand that concern. And so we go to great pains to anonymise things. And then, and if uh, you know you. you don't uh, you know? If you just say look, just just, uh, conf just put confidential on it. Just put confidential on it, and then it obviously doesn't go any further. So, what are we going to do with the association over the uh, over the next few months and years? Uh, we have to decide. Those of us who are contributing, and, uh, and if you're going to stump up your 200 quid after tax relief or whatever. Uh, or how you'd like it to work and uh, I'm increasingly thinking uh, indemnity a formal sort of indemnity scheme might be the way forwards um, and the way that that would work I mean we, we have the legal advice bearing in mind okay let's just start from the premise that most uh, complaints don't come to anything I mean they, you need to be represented in front of the GDC um, and there are, you know, in the days when there are like only two firms that could do that are gone. I mean, there are very, very many, very good uh, lawyers with experience and ability to represent you in front of the General Dental Council now. And they don't need to have a massive, uh, you know, mutual or a massive insurance society behind them. So the representation side of things is not really uh, a problem. And then, then the only other side of it is obviously how you fund any uh, settlement in case you know that in and that's a separate side because the GDC doesn't award damages it uh, you know that's the threat to your livelihood the um, the other side the damages side is uh, in the civil case you know if someone takes you to court and you're found liable in negligence um, and then you have to fund a settlement most settlements are funded out of court they really are not you know I, I as far as I know, and this is coming from one, one of the, the highest source at one of the insurance companies, that almost no cases ever go to court. So the uh, challenge would be to just have a panel of lawyers who could represent members before the GDC and also um, some sort of uh, fund to uh, settle the cases out of court. and and. Where we did it previously, we went through a Lloyd's underwriter, and the Lloyd's, uh, and it was insurance based, and so the members took out an insurance policy, and then the insurance policy paid out. Although I don't think really, as far as I know, they never ever had to pay out. But um, you know, the underwriter just decided what the risk was, decided what the premium was, and decided whether to pay out under the terms of the policy. Um, the other way of doing it, and it's big in America, although not very big over here, is more along the mutual side, where we have a mutual fund 
um, so uh, which would obviously be um, I mean in the early stages it could be underwritten by insurance in case uh, it was called upon in the on the first day or in the first week for example but then as it built up then we could um, you know we could get to the point where we had enough funds to uh, cover the uh, reasonably cover the claims that were likely to come in and uh, in that case then the, the association would become its own uh, mutual it would become a mutual insurer so I'm sure there are you know there's regulatory implications for this and uh, obviously uh, spreadsheeting implications and stuff like that and it, it wouldn't you know in case you're thinking oh this is great my 180 quid is going to buy me indemnity uh, a dream on that, that won't happen uh, but uh, for, for a what I would imagine is a reasonable sum. We could set up a, a mutual, a mutual um, that was uh, uh, where, where the members themselves perhaps decided whether um, to negotiate or go to court or you know or to settle or whatever you know. So that's one idea. But then you might have other ideas. If you've got other ideas about what you want to see the association doing, if you want to see the association putting more pressure on the Department of Health to get pull their fingers out and get some sort of a definitive NHS contract going or lobbying or whatever you know I mean so much of this stuff is is not being done now and it's fallen by the wayside since everyone decided that you know my hobby horse everyone decided that the best way to change the world was to join a Facebook group but um, yeah so let, let me know what you think and uh, where you think the association could go. Whether you think the association's got a role in modern dentistry, you know. I mean, should we just leave it to the BDA to uh, crack on and uh, and just all retire to our practices and concentrate on just making a living and on the basis that we don't really need a support structure in the same way as we used to. You know, we don't look to associations and trades union and uh, trade unions and uh, various sort of external meetings, branch and section meetings and things like that for anything other than, than social or should we just become a social group? Yeah, anyway, talking of mutuals, I've decided, uh, I've been a member of the DGG MBS or GG MBS or something, whatever it is, for a while, for a long time, you know, uh, it's a thing that income protection scheme. And also, um, what was the other one? Was it dental protection? No, not dental protection. They all begin with dental, don't they? That's a trouble. Anyway, I had I was a member of another mutual as well for a long time, and um, uh, I sort of paid monthly into this scheme whereby they sort of guarantee me a bit of a bit of money every month if in case I uh, can't work. But um, you know, being a sort of hardline Austrian economist and not being very happy with um, the decline in purchasing power of the the pound over the period of my life I've decided to, again to take action instead of just talking about it and cash that in <clears throat> and um, going to decide what to do with it but uh, I've got a few I've got a few thoughts about um, income protection and what's the best way to do it you know Based on again, sort of based on my experience, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try. I'm not going to sit down and sort of spreadsheet every penny I've ever paid into DGMBS and try and work out whether it's kept up with inflation or the CPI or the RPI. Well, I might do, but um, yeah. So, uh, but I'm going to um, just. I'm, I've come to a few conclusions about whether or not it's a good thing to do. So, um, but I'll, it's too long to go over now. But I'll go over it on Monday. All right. Okay. And, and because you have renewed, thank you very much. I'll talk to you Monday. Have a nice day. Bye.